Okay. Can everybody see my slides? Yep. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'll uh, I'll preface this with the fact that um, I'm out of the country on hotel wireless, and I hope my wireless holds out for this presentation. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about HPC Toolkit in general and show you how you can use it with Cocos. So um, the obligatory funding slide. So our work is supported by uh, the DOE Tri Labs, uh, the DOE Software Tools Ecosystem Project, which is part of the next generation um, scientific software technologies effort from the, the DOE and a subcontract from Argonne National Lab and uh, some support from Advanced Micro Devices and Total Energies. So um, since this is a, a hands-on tutorial, I thought I'd start with a, a hands-on example. And so um, I shared a copy of the slides with Vivek. Uh, hopefully he can upload them to Slack so that people can have this as a, a reference. Um, what I'm gonna do is, right now is that I'm going to move to um, a separate uh, terminal window and start this up. And then this is going to run and collect data in the background while I'm talking. So I'm moving over to Perlmutter and I'm cloning the examples. And so if you can remember, it's github.com HPC toolkit, HPC toolkit tutorial examples. And now I'm going to CD to examples, GPU, ArborX. So ArborX is a Cocos application. And then I'm just going to say let's source set up parameter, which will set some environment variables. So it's going to put the Cocos modules. So it uh, loaded up uh, HPC toolkit module. It loaded up a Cocos module. Now I'm just going to say, oops. Oh, great. OK. My last piece of automation didn't get checked in. So we'll just wait a moment while this um, builds, and then we'll get it submitted. I had added one more make target where I could say make all, and it would download and build the application. So right now, um, it downloaded Arbor X, which is a, a Cocos application that uh, Vivek pointed me to earlier this week. And um, this is, it's it's being downloaded um, and compiled. And then as soon as it's compiled, then I'm gonna say make run and it's gonna submit it to the batch queue and then we'll come back and check on it in a few minutes. So what we're going to do is there's an ArborX example for molecular dynamics here. And I'm just going to say make run. And this is going to submit it to the batch queue and use HPC toolkit to measure uh, this uh, ArborX molecular dynamics application that is uh, shown right here. And we'll come back and look at that later. OK, so um, apparently I forgot to check in the make all, so I had to say make build and make run. And then later, we're going to come back and, and look at the performance data. OK, so now let me tell you about um, HPC Toolkit. So um, HPC Toolkit is a, a suite of tools that make it easy to measure CPU and GPU accelerated applications. It profiles unmodified application binary. I can still oh. hear you just fine. Did John's hear. microphone give out or? No, someone's oh. here, hears me. Okay, so um, you profile the applications 
uh, unmodified binaries. And so the only caveat is you want to make sure that they're built properly with dash G um, on the CPU, along with your um, optimization options. And then when you're using NVIDIA GPUs to get um, detailed line mapping information on the NVIDIA GPUs, you need to compile with dash line info. And so HPC Toolkit generally has low measurement overhead. When you're measuring GPU accelerated applications, the measurement overhead usually comes from the uh, the vendor's measurement infrastructure. And so we're using NVIDIA's CUPTI. And so there's an unavoidable amount of overhead that comes from CUPTI when we're measuring um, GPU accelerated um, kernels. And um, if we're using um, detailed sampling. So if we're measuring instructions, there's an additional cost for that. And so HPC Toolkit gives you um, informative uh, answers. It, you can see where an application spends its time and why, and that's true even on the GPU. Call has associate uh, metrics with applications source code context, and then you can also get traces to understand how the execution um, advances over time. And so it's designed for a broad audience, application developers, framework developers, runtime and tool developers, such as ourselves. And on the CPUs, it works on x86 power and ARM. And on GPUs, it works on NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel GPUs. So how does uh, HPC Toolkit differ from NVIDIA's tools? Well, NVIDIA's Insight Systems does tracing of CPU and GPU streams. And you analyze the traces when you open them in a GUI. Um, long running traces are, are huge and extremely slow to analyze and that limits the scalability. It's also designed for measurement and analysis within a node. NVIDIA also has a tool called Insight Compute, which supports detailed measurement of kernels using hardware counters and it also does PC sampling and execution replay. The measurement is very slow. It'll replay the kernels uh, 10 times and it will show you a flat display of metrics within the, the GPU kernel. So what I mean is if uh, you call a kernel and it calls some helper functions or inline code, then you will see the helper functions are inline code without any idea of where they've been called from. With HPC Toolkit, we support much more scalable tracing than Insight Systems. We've used it to measure 64,000 MPI ranks and uh, 64K GPU tiles on the frontier um, generate large scale performance data. So we did that for 20 minutes and collected uh, four terabytes of performance data. And we can analyze it relatively quickly. And, and then we were able to actually interactively display um, and navigate through that performance data looking at at traces um, throughout the execution. And I'll show you a, a static screenshot of that uh, in a little bit later. So um, um, another difference is that HPC Toolkit supports scalable parallel post-mortem analysis. And that means it's much faster than the analysis in the GUI that in NVIDIA's tools do. And uh, finally, we support um, detailed reconstruction of estimates for calling context tree profiles within GPU kernels. And you'll see that for the ArborX example. Okay, so uh, let's get on with uh, HPC Toolkit. So you compile and link your, your binaries the way you normally do. And then there's uh, tools, HPC Run, HPC Struct, HPC Prof, and HPC Viewer. And I'll go through each of these in a moment. So this is our workflow that we designed um, two decades ago for, for CPU applications. And then when you're using GPU applications, use the same set of tools, except that um, our measurement tool is recording GPU binaries that it observes being loaded into the GPU at runtime. And then we're analyzing these as well as part of our, our post-mortem analysis. So let me go through the workflow here. So as I mentioned earlier, when you compile your applications, you use your normal make files, your, your CMake or, or make or, or whatever. And um, the one thing that you wanna make sure is that you add uh, dash G for um, as an option on the, the CPU compiler. So, um, and then also add dash line info for NVCC in order to get line information on the GPUs. And so those are just two simple edits that you can do to your make files. And then um, HPC run will profile the execution on CPUs and GPUs and it will record profiles um, of the CPU threads and also the GPU streams. And optionally, it will record trace files that show you the activity 
on the CPU and GPU. And these are rather different than trace files you get from other tools, and you'll see that in just a minute. And so with uh, HPC Run, you're sampling using Linux timers and hardware counter overflows on the CPU. So we're periodically interrupting the application and saying, you know, where are you now? Or how many cache, uh, a million cache misses have uh, occurred and where are you now? We get callbacks when GPU operations are launched. Um, and sometimes when they're completed, we get an event stream for GPU operations and on NVIDIA GPUs, like those on Perlmutter, we can collect PC samples, which do instruction level measurement of uh, GPU kernels. Also, uh, we support binary instrumentation of GPU kernels on Intel GPUs for fine grain measurement. And so that uh, both of those things work for COCOS as well. So on the CPU, we do call stack unwinding to attribute the costs in context. And so when um, a timer goes off or when an instruction counter or when an, a counter overflows, say you're counting cache misses or graduated instructions, You'll get interrupted at some point in the program at some instruction, and then we'll look at um, where you were called from. And so we'll find that we're, we're in some routine C at some instruction when called from B, when called from A, when called from main. And over time, each of these paths get assembled into a tree. And so effectively, we have a tree that's annotated with metrics where the metrics might be cache misses, instructions, cycles, whatever. And also when we launch GPU kernels, uh, we also unwind the call path in the same way so we know exactly where the GPU kernel was launched. So in order to use HPC Run, it's pretty simple. You just launch your application with HPC Run. So um, to profile a GPU application, you say HPC Run-E GPU equals XXX, where that can be NVIDIA, AMD, OpenCL, or Level 0. Level 0 is Intel's infrastructure. And so um, to profile a Cocos application on um, Promutter, you would just say GPU equals NVIDIA, and, and then you launch your application with your arguments. If uh, you want to do PC sampling, then you say GPU equals NVIDIA comma PC. And so, so far here with these options, we're just measuring on the GPU. You can also measure on the CPU as well. So here's a, an example where I can say C, that I want to measure um, CPU time. Um, I can also uh, sample using hardware counters like uh, cycles or instructions or cache misses. And so I would just give a dash E and one of the counter names. And you can find out the counter names from um, HPC run dash L to list everything. And so here um, I've also specified a dash T option. And that says that I'm going to be tracing what's going on in the CPU and what's going on in the GPU. And um, so that's the, the simple way that you launch a uh, single process application. And if you're using a job launcher like you went on Perlmutter, then in fact, you can launch it over uh, a large number of nodes. And so here I'm just launching it on one node on one GPU, but you can launch it on, on all of the nodes of Perlmutter and on each of the GPUs in, in each of the nodes. And then you just launch your application. So if you have an MPI application, you just write your MPI application here and you're just injecting um, the... Uh, the HPC run uh, prologue before um, your uh, application name. So the, the second part of our workflow is something called HPC struct. And so what this does is it analyzes CPU and GPU program structure. So in your binaries, when we're collecting information at, uh, at, at runtime, when we're collecting profiles and traces, we're relating things to machine code addresses. And so HPC struct recovers the mappings from the machine code addresses to your source code, and it records these program structure files. And so when you launch it, you just say HPC struct. And when you when you collect data with HPC run, it's going to leave a, a directory full of measurement data. And so you just launch HPC struct on your measurement directory. For um, NVIDIA GPUs, there's one option, GPU CFG, yes, that you might want to add. And so you only want to add this if you're using PC sampling to collect instruction level performance measurements. And the reason why it's an option at all um, is that um, NVIDIA doesn't give us a proper infrastructure for this. And, um, and so it's a little bit costly. And so we use this as an option. On other platforms, um, it's just done automatically. So what HPC Run does, it, HPC Struct does, is it recovers program structure information, files, functions, inline templates of, or functions, loops, and source lines. And um, it does this in general in parallel. Um, it analyzes the CPU and GPU binaries that were measured by HPC Toolkit. And by default, it uses the CPU set that you've been given um, 
and it will analyze many things, small binaries with two threads and large applications with 16 threads. Um, and then it will cache the binary analysis results for later. So if you're in a workflow where you're continually modifying your application, there's no reason why you need to uh, reanalyze the, the binaries for the MPI library or libc or whatnot. You analyze them once, put them in the cache, and then they just get used again. So the next thing in the workflow is HPC prof or HPC prof MPI. And so what this does is it's used to take the profile files, the trace files, and the program structure files and combine them all. And so when you use this, you just apply it to the measurement directory because all the measurement data is in the measurement directory. And when we ran HPC struct on the measurement directory, it records the binary analysis results there as well. And so this is running HPC prof is going to analyze the data and use multi-threading. And so um, it's going to use all of the threads on the node that you're running on. And in general, um, that's that's enough to analyze um, pretty sizable executions. If you're analyzing something that is very large, then you might um, launch HPC prof MPI. Now, the dash MPI just means that HP, this H, HPC prof MPI is an MPI program. And so um, you can launch um, multiple um, multiple processes that are each going to use multi-threading to analyze large-scale data faster. I don't think that you'll need to, to use this. HPC prof is, is sufficient for um, all but the largest scale measurements. So then finally, um, we have a user interface called HPC Viewer, which presents uh, trace profile and uh, metric views. And so here is the code-centric analysis view. And so what we have are three panes. There's a source pane, a navigation pane, and a metric pane. And then over here, there's some view controls. So we can look at a top-down view, a bottom-up view, and uh, a flat view of these calling context trees that I showed you earlier. There's some things for controlling the metric display. The flame button will show you the hot path. So you click on it and it'll open up uh, long paths to show you what matters. There's uh, an F of X for computing derived metrics. And there's uh, something for uh, selecting uh, the columns of, of metrics you wanna display and something else for writing it out in, uh, in CSV format. So one thing to note is that here we're looking at a top down view. And what we see in the call path, the blue things are actually represent procedures. The red represents um, loops. The green represents inline functions. And um, here is uh, here is uh, some Raja templates. And then we have outlined OpenMP. And basically, you get all of this integrated together. And it costs nothing extra to get all of this detail because there's no cost for this during measurement. Um, all we're doing is we're measuring the uh, the call chains as I, as I mentioned by looking up at the uh, the call paths. The additional information about inline functions and loops is being um, interpolated by HPC struct um, post mortem. So um, so far I've talked about our profiling. To understand temporal behavior, the profiles compress out the time dimension. And so what we do actually is, if you're interested in tracing, then what we're going to trace is a, a, a series of call stack samples for every thread. And so at time t, we're going to unwind the call stack and collect a, a call stack sample. At time t plus delta, we're going to unwind. At t plus 2 delta, we're going to unwind. And we do this for every thread and for every GPU stream in the application. And so at the top of this view, it's like everybody's in main, and then below that, maybe they're in they're in something like run. And then below that, there's like maybe some initialization followed by some solve phase. And then when we go deeper, then you see details inside the solve phase. And so what you have is this multidimensional view of your uh, application as it executes. So here's an example of a trace uh, where we're looking at uh, the trace at a certain depth. And so this is a trace that's on uh, CPUs only. And so this shows MPI ranks, OpenMP threads, um, and GPU streams. This one happens to be just using uh, the CPU. And then on the horizontal axis, we have time. So time uh, proceeds from left to right. And there's a depth view. And so for the this cursor out here, this cursor, is the crosshair is on rank 93. And this is showing the the what the call stack looks like on rank 93 
over time. The, the cursor, um, the call stack pane over here shows you the call stack at this particular point in time. So this is 86 seconds into the execution on rank 93. And that is the full call chain that we've gathered using the call stack unwinding. The, uh, the color at a particular point here represents um, the procedure that is active on the particular um, node at that particular point in time. And so um, if we're looking at GPUs, then the, the color might represent uh, GPU kernels as well. And then finally, um, there's a, a mini map in the right corner that shows the fraction of the execution that we're looking at. And so the, the black pane represents the entire execution. So we're just looking at a stripe early on in the execution. And you notice that you can see that there's load imbalance here. And so um, there's a, a sharp edge here, and this is actually a collective synchronization. And some of the some of the MPI ranks are spending longer in um, this setup phase than than others. Some of them finish it early, and some of them uh, go longer. And so we can do this with GPUs as well. All right. So um, a brief summary of some of the things we did during the Exascale Computing Project: We built measurement support for GPU accelerated applications on AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA GPUs. We built some support for um, source level measurement of, of Python based frameworks for, for AI. Um, we uh, are, we have parallel binary analysis to accelerate that. Um, we can do performance analysis and attribution for MPI plus OpenMP on um, using MPI and OpenMP to uh, analyze large scale data. We're now using sparse representations to reduce the size of our analysis results. And um, we've done a lot of work on our um, interactive presentation tool to make sure that it scales. And so actually you can use the user interface displaying terabytes of information from a remote virtual desktop. So here's a, an example of, of our HPC struct tool. So our HPC struct tool is analyzing a 7.7 .7 gigabyte binary um, of TensorFlow. And it does it in 177 sec, I'm uh, sorry, in 77 seconds using 32 threads. And so this is showing how the trace view works, where initially there's one thread working, and then it uses OpenMP and starts up a series of OpenMP threads that are reading symbol tables. And so what I'm showing you here is our tools analyzing the execution of our tools. Then there's a, a serial phase, then we're analyzing application binaries, and then we're assembling our analysis results. And what we see is a bunch of independent trace lines where there's independent activity, and that's because we're using OpenMP tasking and everybody's doing whatever they need to do at that point in time. And so it's really just a, um, a, a mishmash of colors here. But in fact, by looking at the colors that are prevalent and then finding out what they what they are, um, we, we can identify whether you're spending time in locking or whatnot and whether we're executing efficiently. And here we have some, some serialization and we can see the serialization of certain phases. We determined that we didn't care, that this, this is fine, 70 seconds is, is uh, is short enough for analyzing a uh, seven gigabyte binary. So this is also showing that we can analyze uh, large scale performance data. So we collected 38 gigabytes of performance data for 2K MPI ranks and 2K GPUs. And we analyzed it using a thousand threads in 41 seconds. And so this is some data that was collected and analyzed on Perlmutter. Um, we have a very parallel analysis phase and the colors here just show that everybody's doing whatever they need to do for the, the analysis. And so there's some serialization in the front and in the back, but it's still pretty quick for a fairly large amount of data. All right, so now let's look at some, some case studies. Let me check on my time. Okay, so first I'm gonna go through um, I'm going to show you sort of what HPC Toolkit is capable of for GPU accelerated programs. I'm going to use games, which happens to be an OpenMP um, example. And I'm using this just to show off the capabilities for GPU analysis. I only learned about this uh, tutorial a few days ago, so I don't have uh, full COCUS examples for this. The ArborX example is the one that I just started a few minutes ago, and we'll come back to that. And then we've also measured LAMPS, uh, which is a COCOS application on Frontier on 64K um, MPI ranks and GPU tiles. So let's look at, at GAMES, which is a, an ab initio quantum chemistry package. And so we collected some data in a, a former Perlmutter hackathon. We collected it on a single node using four GPUs and then five nodes uh, using 20 GPUs. So here is um, uh, 
a some some trace data from games running on four ranks and four GPUs. And so uh, the blue here in the, is, is actually a bunch of OpenMP threads that are idle that are waiting for work. And so in our user interface, you can pull up um, over from the filter button, you can pull up a filter menu, and then um, and then you can say uncheck all and then search for GPU and then just say, I wanna just see the GPU streams and say check all and then say, okay. Then we come up with a view that looks like this. And so what this is showing is the activity for the duration of this run just on the, the GPU traces. And if we zoom in and we look at an individual iteration, you immediately notice that in fact, there's some load imbalance here, that, um, that this thread is spending a much shorter time in this kernel than, than uh, the last GPU. And in fact, we can see what this kernel is because we have the complete call stack here. And so this is what the, um, the games team calls their J06 kernel. And there's also some load imbalance here. And so we talked about that with the team and the issue was that they were um, using triangular iteration spaces and giving everybody an equal number of rows. And so they made some adjustments to that. Um, here we can see a graphical view. And so um, in HPC Viewer, you can also use, um, use this, uh, this graphing view to graph individual metrics. And so this is showing the time in the J06 kernel. And I've just drawn the line here to, to make it clear where the points are. And what we're looking at is the imbalance across the GPUs. So um, now the improved version, um, you can see that there's uh, a little imbalance in the other direction where they tried to partition it uh, more evenly it turns out that the imbalance is less with, with this partitioning. So it's not exactly equal, but it is improved. So, and this, this shows the improvement in the graphical view. So now looking at something a little bit larger across five nodes and 40 ranks with uh, 20 GPUs. And so I'll do the same thing where I just, um, where I go into the filter menu and say, suppress all the CPU trace lines and just show me the GPU trace lines. And this is what we see. And so this is a, a really important high level view because what it shows you is that when they're using the multiple ranks with multiple GPUs, they have um, their processes working together in groups of, of four on the GPUs. And so what they're doing is they're partitioning their computation into the in, into uh, pieces that are being done by a group of four GPUs. And so you can see that this GPU, in fact, ended up with a lot of work, and this one ended up with uh, very little, and the same thing is true over here. And so all of this idle time is, is load imbalance. And so then um, they went back, and uh, after we showed them that data, and they improved their partitioning, and you can see that they've been able to reduce their load imbalance. Another thing to notice is that on the right side over here, we see that there are these white gaps, persistent white gaps between every phase. And so we went to, to take a look at that. So now we're showing actually just one CPU trace line. And then we zoomed in to look at what's, what's going on. And we found that there was a, a sequential call to an, um, an open blas routine. And, um, and so their, their code here, was um, was doing a triangular matrix multiply and it was using DAXB operations and it was doing it serially. And so the GPUs weren't active because they were spending their time on serial code. And so then um, they replaced it with um, a call to a, a parallel version of the triangular matrix multiply and, um, and they were able to improve the, the performance of the application because it eliminated the gaps between the GPU kernels. And so when you're using HPC Toolkit, you can, to work with GPU accelerated programs, you look at both the CPU and the GPU part. Okay, so now we're, we're back to Arbor X. So let's see if the performance data is collected. Okay, uh, no, not all of it, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure why it uh, why it didn't run. Okay, but that's good because I have CAN performance data that I'll show you right here. So you out. I'm sorry. The job timed out due to time limit. 
Yeah, no, I can I can see that, except that I've run this task before. Um, it looks like it failed to allocate the node correctly. Okay, but well, um, I can, let's see. I can try running that again in, in the background. So I've done this uh, a number of times, so I'm confident that the script is okay, but um, we'll see what happens. It's submitting it with the Entrain um, project. So um, let this, okay, this will run in the queue in the background. In the meantime, we'll look at the results that I already have on my laptop. And so um, here is, so I just click this uh, flame button and this shows the call path through ArborX and through Cocos and then down through launching the GPU kernel. And so here is uh, one of the Cocos kernels. And if we go back to where we see a uh, Cocos Parallel 4, um, that this is the Parallel 4 for uh, ArborX tree traversal spatial is being launched through this call chain. So we can see the, the call site we can see the parallel four function, and then we can go through all of the levels of the template instantiation where it executes a closure, which, um, and and so this is probably more, in, uh, more of interest to the Cocos developers to see how their templates instantiated um, because there's a lot of detail in the, in the template names. Now here, we were not doing measurement using in instruction level measurement on the GPU, we're just measuring at the kernel level. And so um, it just shows that this, this kernel was launched and we can see by looking up the call stack where it was launched. So right now we're not using the um, the Cocos tool interface to, to, uh, to name these things with labels. And so um, I think they have, uh, let's see. Uh, they may have some some use of the the Cocos tool interface to to uh, add some labels around here. I'm not that familiar with this particular um, application. The labels are less important with HPC Toolkit because you can just find the call site where um, where the kernel was invoked, and so you can see what in fact is being invoked um, on the node. So let's go look at the trace for this. So the trace is actually kind of a mess, and um, and so if we look at what's going on here, this is actually, it turns out that there's a whole bunch of libgomp threads. And so apparently the OpenMP gets fired up and um, it just sit it, it's the OpenMP threads are sitting and waiting for work and um, nothing is, nothing's happening. So I'm just going to filter out all of these OpenMP threads. And so um, I'm going to show, let's see, I'll uncheck them all and I'm interested in thread zero. And then there's actually some, some GPU streams in here. And so I'll show all of those. And so now we're down to sort of three things of interest. And um, if we look at what's going on, there are the, uh, the GPU streams here. There's very short, um, very short kernels that are being launched. And so we see these kernels and there are, um, copy ins and what you can see is from the from the larger scale view in fact um the code is the that the gpu is idle um much of the time and so the the takeaway is that this is a very short example this runs for for about a second and so the interesting thing about it is that it's a, a pretty sophisticated code and so we'll look at the the details inside the code in a minute and then if we zoom in, in fact, we can see that there's a, a series of, of kernels that are invoked. So this is using um, NVIDIA CUB, um, Cocos uh, parallel kernel launch and data copies. And you can see the sequence of them. And you can see that in fact, um, that there's a lot of idle time between them. So now let's go look at the PC sample data. So, um, if we go and uh, look at this from the, the top, then what this shows us is now we see the same parallel kernel launch. 
And then we can follow that all the way through the Cocos down to the point where it crosses into the GPU. And so we, we drop this uh, in the call stack to say, here's the point where you're crossing from the CPU to the GPU. And so we can see um, there's uh, the CUDA parallel launch local memory, and then a series of inline functions that go through Cocos and then go through the um, through ArborX's um, tree traversal. So this is doing um, some sort of uh, some sort of geometric search. And what we have here is, is this is showing us the GPU instructions that we've measured, and you can see where in the the code we're uh, we're executing GPU instructions. Um, there's also um, information here about stalls, and so this says that uh, in this kernel we've executed 47% of the GPU instructions, and we've also incurred 40% of the stalls. You'll notice that there's 1.39 um, times 10 to the seventh GPU instructions, and there's almost an equal number of stalls. And so there's a, a fair bit of, of stalling that's going on. And we can see whether the stall the stalls are happening due to instruction fetching. Um, and then there's also stalls for global memory. So I'm not gonna argue that this column-based presentation is the best interface, but that's what we've got. We've spent a lot of time working on the data collection. So also what we can see is that there's uh, some details here about, um, about uh, the, sample, the sample data that we've collected. And so there's a, a number of samples that we've expected and the number we've collected. And so if all of the SMs were running, then um, we would collect our expected number of samples. But th actually there's uh, less use of the, the GPU, par the, the parallelism in the hardware than, um, than we could have. And so that means in fact that the GPU is not running as effectively as, as it, it could. And that's shown by a GPU utilization column that says that the GPU is running at 25% at utilization. We also have um, information. There's more columns of information. There's too many columns of information, but there's um, columns of information that talk about uh, data copies in, in and out. Um, this is saying that the maximum number of, of threads that we could have is uh, 64, but we're only using 32 of them. There's uh, 21 registers being used by each thread. There's um, 128 threads in a block and um, and there's 128 blocks and this tells us the number of times the kernel is launched and this tells us we have a 50 percent occupancy meaning that we're using half the threads that that we could here so um, anyway so this what this shows is that you can you can get very detailed information about what's going on in the kernel and so um, you can do detailed analysis of this much in the same way that you would use um, detailed uh, sampling-based information on the CPU. You can find out what kernels are costly and where you're spending your time. So if I go back to look at uh, one high-level thing, this, so this is a column that we call GPU operations. And so if I go all the high level, I'll close this up. And so this says that 61% of our GPU operations are um, in a call path that's that's below this. So let me go look at a place that I haven't looked at yet. It says that 14% of the GPU operations are here. And if I look down the bottom, so then this shows me that there's a, a cub kernel that's performing um, a radix sort down here. And so the GPU operations can show kernel launches. And so there's a column that that's focused on kernels. There are other columns that are focused on, on data copies. I don't see, um, here's some, some data copies. So this says that the data copies can be found. Um, let's see, select the data copy column. Okay, and I wanna show where the data copies are. So this shows where we're doing deep copies into the GPU. 
So I hope that this gives you a sense of how you can use HPC Toolkit to see your performance data. Um, actually understanding the application, that's going to take a little bit of time. As I said, this application is unfamiliar to me. Um, something that's unique about HPC Toolkit is when you're looking at these operations in the, in the GPU, no other tool is going to um, give you these reconstructed call stacks and inline code inside the, the GPU to show you um, the, the detail about where you spend your time and where you uh, incur um, costs associated with stalls. All right. So then I want to go back to the slide. Well, let me go back to uh, the terminal here. This time, this time I was able to collect uh, the PC sample measurements and um, and it is still running for the second example. Um, it's still doing the data analysis for the second example. So um, if you want, you can download you can download the tutorial examples and you can run make build and make run and then make view to look at the, the data yourself. There's also uh, a copy of the data that I've uh, put on the, the system in um, a directory. So it's listed on the page. So um, there's also the data from ArborX is, is over here and you can look at it using HPC Viewer. Just by loading the HPC Toolkit model, module, you can use um, HPC Viewer to look at the ArborX data that I've already collected. Okay, so back to the presentation. So I'm just gonna skip through the um, ArborX thing. So I mentioned that there's a bunch of GPU metrics. I'm not gonna go through them all here. They're in the slides for your reference. Um, I'll show you a little bit about um, some measurements that we took with um, LAMPS on Frontier using, so LAMPS uses COCOS, and we measured this on 64K CPUs and 64K GPUs, and so it's an SPMD application, and so everybody's doing the same thing, so it's a molecular dynamics application, and what we would have expected is that all of these would be like vertical lines, and so what we're looking at here is just the GPU activity, and so what you can see is that there's a regular iterative pattern, there's a there's something general that they do that's that shows up as kind of green, and then there's another kernel that shows up as blue. And one thing that's of interest is that there's this like irregular pattern that seems to occur on every major iteration where there's some kind of inefficiency that causes some idleness. And so the white space represents idleness. So when we zoomed in on that, in fact, we can see that what's filling the white space. So we revealed a few CPU trace lines amidst the, the GPU trace lines. And what we found in here is that there's time spent in MPI receive and in MPI send. And so it's very clear that the time is, is being filled with um, send and receive. And so one of the questions then is, is that because um, your communication partners are waiting for you to exchange data with them? Or is it because there's a problem with slingshot and so are the, the slow messaging, is that a cause or um, are we seeing our time spent in there as an effect? Now, you'll notice here that I'm looking at um, this very small fraction. So in fact, there's like a tiny little dot here, like a pixel that shows the this fraction of the 20 minute execution on 64K GPU tiles. But you can go in and look at all the detail, just like, I said, like I'm showing here. And so uh, another thing that we did is we plotted um, the time that was spent in MPI send. And so there are a, a bunch of um, GPU streams that are that are not doing any sending. And for the CPU streams that are involved in the sending, we see this wide distribution of send where it's um, is. So these are below 50 seconds and these are above 150 seconds. And so there's a, a widespread on time spent in MPI send. And so the question is, is this the cause of, of the problem or is this a symptom of the problem? And uh, we didn't have enough time on Frontier to actually dig into this in, in detail, but we can see that the issue is there. 
Um, and then finally, this is a, a histogram view that you can get by using this uh, graphics button. And so um, both of the views, this view and the previous view um, are uh, for graphing metrics that are associated with particular nodes in the calling context tree. And then finally, um, this is a, a detail. This is a very small detail from an execution in LAMPS um, where um, my student ran it and uh, didn't do the weak scaling right. And so instead of running kernels that were running for milliseconds, they were running for microseconds. And you notice we got this very weird pattern of delays that came out. And so the question is, is that because we're pushing the slingshot network too hard? Or is that because there's something else going on? And so we had a discussion with AMD about it, and they think that it might be due to GPU scratch space reclamation. And so one of the interesting things is they don't have any way of measuring that, or they didn't at the time. And so they're working on that in their the new version of their interface. And so um, in some cases, you can measure that there are issues with the performance tools, and um, it's hard to understand exactly what they are because the 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 root cause might be below the measurement API that we've been given by the vendor. And so this is understanding this is still a work in progress. But um, it's interesting because this is four and a half terabytes of, of uh, performance data and we can interactively explore this and render new views in about 10 seconds. And so we we're doing this at Rice on a virtual desktop from Frontier, displaying this with our user interface running on a login node. Um, this is just another view that shows, in fact, um, for, for lamps, this is showing that uh, the, the time spent is in, in these red and green, and these are associated with, uh, with send receive. Um, and so some, some, are, uh, some are doing MPI weights and some are in, in uh, um, send receive. And this is showing the, the columns and you would expect all of this to be just very vertical. But in fact, you see it's these strange patterns and those those would fit right in here. And so there's like equal delays being applied even though the, the costs are staggered. And so we're still trying to get into why that's happening. So some things that we're working on right now is some support for the NVTX and RockTX caliper and Cocos labels support for instruction level measurement and attribution on Intel and AMD GPUs, some new GUI support for analysis of remote data. So you can run a server on a remote system and then have it feed data to your um, to HPC viewer running on your, your laptop or a Linux system remotely. And so this is independent of what you can do using say NX or, or VNC, independent of a virtual desktop solution. And then we also have a, a, an emerging Python based interface for analysis of performance results. Okay, I think I've used my time. Um, uh, unfortunately, I've used my time. So I'm, I'm happy to take any, any brief questions, but um, Vivek, feel free to give me the hook if you want to move on. Yeah, we, we can do one quick question. Um, I, th I think it was a good talk. And yeah, yeah, let, yeah let's see if there's one question. If not, I, I'll ask one also. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, yeah, um, my, I mean, yeah, I guess this was a really great. Um, and thanks again uh, for the talk. Uh, one question is, um, so in, in all of this, uh, uh, are you considering or is there any use for um, you know, from the tools, Cocos tools side, um, you know, like things like filtering or sampling for data order reduction, or is it, or, you know, okay, does the HPC toolkit actually do the sampling? Um, you know, is, is, you know, is there any need basically if, if, if from the HPC toolkit side? Getting so um, one of the things that that we've been building is support for uh, labeling with the NVTX and RockTX and, and Caliper labels. And so we have that um, implemented and it's uh, waiting uh, emerge into our develop branch. Um, I think we can also take the, the Cocos labels as well. And so that would allow um, a user to, to inject um, semantic labels 
into to, to say uh, this is my solver and sort of ignore um, these four thousand character names um, yeah. for for measuring only parts of your program. We have a, a start stop interface for HPC toolkit. We're happy to wire that into um, the the Cocos interface for turning things on and off. Um, we haven't used any any Cocos facilities for data reduction. We're doing all of our own data reduction inside HPC Toolkit at the uh, present. Well, there so is I, there. Okay, yes, yeah, so there is so, some writing in there. So, okay, so I'd be happy to have a, a discussion with you offline about you know, yep. ways that better support the Cocos interface in HPC Toolkit. Yep. Yep. That'll be good. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, and we are uh, running behind. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so the next person, uh, Ke Kevin, um, do you, uh, you, can you share the screen? I can. 